Hi, my name is Megan Candy. I'm a pediatric neurologist at Primary Children's at the University of Utah. Um, I am a headache specialist and I am UCNS certified in headache medicine. I'm one of the only um, pediatric child neurologist, or sorry, pediatric neurologist certified um, in headache medicine in Utah and the surrounding states. Um, so I have the opportunity to, to talk to a lot of people about pediatric headache um, and to see a lot of patients with headache um, and their families. So it's um, wonderful when I have a chance to talk to a new group of people um, and hopefully um, you'll be able to glean some information about how we manage headaches in children. So this talk is entitled Brain Pain in Kids. Um, and there'll be parts that I'll kind of fly through um, and then some parts that I'll uh, focus on a little bit longer just um, to allow time for questions. And hopefully I can Go from slide to slide. There we go. Um, I have nothing to disclose. Uh, at the end of this talk, it's my hope that people will have an enhanced appreciation of the prevalence and burden of pediatric headache, um, that people might be able to recognize primary versus secondary headache types, um, that you can acknowledge indications for brain imaging, so when we image and when we don't, um, and also have an enhanced understanding of the treatment uh, and prevention options available. I'd like to start off with some facts. This is a slide from the New York and Migraine Foundation talking about the burden of migraine, specifically in children. Um, and we'll be talking about migraine and tension headaches, but um, I just like to talk about this first. So um, migraine impacts over 37 million men, women, and children in the United States. Um, and approximately 10% of children will experience migraine in their life. Um, and if a child has a parent with migraine, that number increases from 50 to 75%, um, largely due to the inherited component of migraine. Um, so I like this because it highlights some of those facts and the burden of the disease. Um, one other thing about this slide is that on the bottom right, you'll notice that the cost of headache uh, or of migraine is $20 million per year in the U.S. due to direct medical expenses and lost productivity that's in adults and in children who are missing school. So one of the first things that your headache providers, either your primary care doctor or um, neurologist or headache specialist will try to do is to differentiate um, what as to what type of headache you have. And the, the two big components that we're trying to differentiate between are primary and secondary. So primary meaning that the headache itself is the issue and the thing that needs to be addressed versus secondary headaches where the headache is due to a different disorder. So it is secondary to an infection or a, a prior injury. Um, and then fortunately, the majority of the headaches that we see in children are primary headaches. Um, so specifically tension headaches and migraine headaches. There are also, there's also a separate group of primary headaches um, called the trigeminal autonomic cephalgias, which are a specific headache type um, that actually encompasses a bunch of different kinds of headache. And that would be the topic of another talk, but that's much less common in children, but something that we are um, trying to differentiate um, from other types of primary headaches and other types of secondary headaches. And I think this uh, is a, the main reason why a lot of people want to come and see a headache specialist is to be reassured that there is not a, um, that their child does not have a secondary headache, that it is not due to another process that is going on. So just to um, define the types of headaches that we talk about, tension headache is known by lots of different names, uh, muscle headache, um, uh, stress headache. In order to have this headache type, you need to have two of the four. So pain needs to be bilateral of a pressing or tightening quality with mild to moderate intensity, and it's not worsened by routine activity. So you can still kind of push through. Um, some patients also have tenderness of their scalp. Um, you can have light or noise sensitivity, that are the fancy names for that, or photo or phonophobia, um, as you might see in migraine, but you don't, um, so those might be tension present with tension headaches, um, but they don't have to be. Um, usually there's not nausea or vomiting associated with tension headache. And the duration can range from a half hour up to a couple of days. And so th this is an important definition to keep in mind as we talk about migraine headache. Um, so with migraine headache, you have to, um, in adults, you have to have at least two of the following. So the headache needs to be unilateral, pulsing or throbbing of moderate or severe pain and aggravated by activity. So that's how it's differentiated from tension headache. 
in children, so it's not always unilateral. Oftentimes children will point to the, their forehead or right above their eyes. So in children, we think of it as a little bit more bilateral. Um, and then to have a diagnosis of migraine, you have to have at least five, had five attacks. So if you've had one or two, you actually don't meet the criteria for being diagnosed with migraine yet. Um, and then you have to also have either nausea and or vomiting um, or photo and phonophobia. So light um, and noise sensitivity. The duration tends to be a little bit longer. So more like four to 72 hours. And when we talk about treating migraine, we specifically aim for a resolution of the pain within two hours, ideally as fast as possible. I like this picture because it highlights how much more we have learned about migraine, that it is not just a headache. So it is not just that third column, but it's actually all of the symptoms that patients experience before. We call that the prodrome and or the aura. Many people are familiar with visual aura or seeing things in your vision before the headache starts. And then also the postdrome, so the symptoms that people experience after headache. And I think this is really interesting to show to families who might say, oh yeah, you know, looking back, my child um, has these specific cravings beforehand, or they might have these um, other types of aura beforehand. And yeah, you know, even when their headache is gone, they're still a little bit more depressed and a little and having a little bit more difficulty concentrating. So keeping in mind that migraine is not headache alone, but kind of this broad uh, spectrum and timeline um, of events and that there are things we can do to treat all of these phases. This graph highlights how in children 10 and under, the prevalence, um, gender prevalence is pretty equitable that girls and boys experience headache with similar rates, um, but that once you get um, into the pubertal stage or adolescence that the prevalence of headache shoots up in girls and kind of levels off in boys. The majority of patients who have migraine specifically um, have episodic. So they'll have, you know, one a month or one a quarter um, versus uh, others who have headaches that occur or migraine that occur more than 15 days a month. And that's when we call it chronic. I would say that in our clinic, these numbers are switched and that we probably see many more patients who have chronic migraine um, who are really experiencing significant impairment as a result of their headache and migraine. Um, and uh, but Overall, the majority of, or of the people who have migraine more will have episodic than chronic headache. Um, and there are known risk, risk factors. Again, I mentioned gender, genetics, certainly with family history, um, and then socioeconomic status. We know that that in and of itself is a risk factor for migraine. This graph highlights the different time courses of migraine that people can have. So people can have just, and again, the acute episodic episodes, um, which can then transform if they're not being treated well or if the other issues are not being addressed, kind of transform into more of a chronic process. The pathophysiology, meaning why do we actually get migraine, what is happening in the brain, is still being elucidated. And I think there are so many interesting um, factors and, th and things that are being studied and ways in which we can approach migraine, which makes it exciting in that there are, will likely continue to be ways in which we can intervene and help people who have migraine. Um, but that, again, would be also a talk in and of itself in terms of what is actually happening in the brain and what are some of the um, inflammatory factors that are uh, that we can kind of approach uh, for treatment. So the red flags, these are the things that make me think, hmm, is this not a primary headache, but could this be a secondary headache? Um, include things like a new headache in a person who's never had headaches before, that it's progressive. So it started and it just continues to get worse, that they have persistent aura so that they're having some kind of neurological symptoms, whether it be changes in vision or changes in sensation or even weakness um, that are not going away um, and maybe aren't even associated with headache. Um, altered mental status. So people that aren't waking up enough, aren't able to um, make sense of what's going on. If there are signs that would suggest possible meningitis, things like a stiff or painful neck, and then any other changes in how they're moving or walking. Those would be things that would make me think about imaging. So um, lots of parents want reassurance. Again, I know that nothing scary or nothing else is the cause of their child's headache. And for the most part, we can say if a child has a normal neurological exam, if there's a family history of migraine, and if the history that's being provided really is suggestive of migraine, that we do not need to do other testing, that we can confirm the diagnosis. I think about imaging when a child is less than three and complaining of head pain, when there's no family history, um, when there's a component that suggests that the pain changes based on position or activity, 
Um, I mentioned skin findings because there are certain syndromes, um, especially in children, neurocutaneous syndromes, um, like tuberous sclerosis, for instance, where kids, we know that they have birthmarks that are suggestive of a syndrome, um, and then they're at higher risk for having complications or secondary headaches. So that might prompt me to image more, to image sooner. If there are focal symptoms, meaning, again, someone's presenting with a face weakness or arm weakness or other things that we wouldn't expect to happen in migraine. So we can't image everyone. It's just not possible. We don't have enough resources um, and it would cost a lot of money. And we probably find out about things that we didn't even want to know about, things like little cysts and asymmetries and things like that that wouldn't change our management. So we really try to be judicious in how we decide or in deciding who should be imaged. Um, there's also risk. So there's risk of sedation at primary children's. We, we sedate children eight and under if they're having um, MRIs done. Uh, radiation. So if a child were to go to the uh, emergency room, for instance, oftentimes they'll have a head CT performed and that includes radiation. Um, braces, lots of kids have braces and that can obscure the results um, of MRIs. And I mentioned kind of incidental findings, things we didn't go looking for, but that we find. Um, as people watching this video likely know uh, migraine is significantly disabling for children and adults. It was um, the seventh most significant cause of disability in people 10 to 14. Um, and I forget which year this was from, but I want to say the late um, 20 teens. Um, and nausea was found to be the strongest predictor when kids were missing school. One interesting study done out of North Carolina showed um, compared children in 20, 2007 to children in 2015, looking to see have, has migraine become more common? And they found actually that headache frequency had remained stable at about 6%. And again, we talked about 6 to 10% of kids with migraine, but that the days of school that were missed due to headache had increased significantly from 70% up to 139%. So doubling during that time. Um, there are factors that we believe, you know, contribute to headache perpetuation. So that, again, they're not the cause for why someone has headaches, but they can certainly contribute to headaches occurring more frequently um, and perhaps even um, lasting longer. Things like concurrent mood disorders, so depression and anxiety, we ask about those things in our clinic, whether there are learning issues that can be stressful at school. Um, are, and for instance, does a child have an IEP that's not, um, not being adhered to at school? Is the child not getting the support that they deserve? Uh, eating patterns. Lots of kids don't want to eat breakfast or they don't want to eat school lunch, or maybe the food that they have access to isn't healthy and, you know, contributing to obesity, which can also be a factor that contributes to headache. Inactivity and excessive electronics use. So the strain on our eyes are not moving around and getting good blood flow. Um, insomnia and sleep dysregulation. There are lots of reasons for kids to worry nowadays. Um, everything from what's going on in the world to social media, things like that. So lots of um, things, factors that can play upon sleep. Um, chaotic home environments, lots of busy families. We understand that. Um, and then early adverse child event, childhood events can also contribute. So early neglect or early food insecurity, homelessness, things like that. And those are important to ask about. So I thought I would just highlight a little bit what we do at Primary Children's in our comprehensive pediatric headache clinic. We started this clinic back in 2017, I believe. Um, and Dr. Kaplan, um, who's a psychologist, she and I continue to um, oversee this clinic, uh, which meets once a week. Currently, we hope to expand it beyond that. Um, but Every new patient that comes to this clinic is seen by a neurologist, a psychologist, and a nurse educator. So every person is told to expect to see three people and to be there for one to two hours. Um, and our goals of seeing patients in this clinic is to provide a multidisciplinary approach um, where we can, again, confirm that diagnosis and provide reassurance as to why the diagnosis is being made. We can discuss the causes of migraine because I think a lot of people worry that they don't think children should be getting headaches. So we talk about the genetic predisposition for migraine, talk about whether or not any other testing is, is indicated. So rarely we'll do imaging uh, if we are worried about a secondary headache, but most often we do not. Um, talk about areas that um, which families are struggling. So is the challenge, you know, getting the child to sleep, getting access to lunch, um, addressing the learning issues that are going on in school and come up with a good plan. Um, we talk about abortive therapy, so that's treating the actual headache when it occurs, and then also preventive therapy. So what are things we can do to reduce the number and the duration of the headaches that are occurring? Um, the goals, as outlined by the American Academy of Neurology Practice Guideline Update in 2019 for the treatment of migraine in children and adolescents, outlined that the treatment should be fast, complete pain relief with minimum side effects, 
It's important to treat the associated symptoms, which we've mentioned, treating early, um, and that most children would benefit from non-prescription oral medicine. So things we already have access to, things like ibuprofen and naproxen. So in 2019, those are still the recommended medications that we have. Um, so here and here they are. So on the left are the over-the-counter medicines that we use. Um, and it's important in our clinic, we will make sure that you know the right dose to give for your child based on their weight. I think many families don't want to overdo it. And so, you know, clarifying that it's important to give the right dose. And then on the right side are some of the prescription medicines um, that I'll highlight here. So Maxalt is a triptan medication, which is available for kids down to six years of age. Zofran, um, and that's to treat headache. Zofran is an anti-nausea medicine. Periactin is a medicine that are also known as superheptidine that sometimes we'll use for headache prevention. That, that would be a medicine that kids would take every day. And the side effects of that medication include sleepiness and sedation. So I think it's helpful in a lot of, uh, sorry, sleepiness and increased appetite, which is helpful for many young children who are not, who are so busy playing that they don't uh, want to stop to eat or to go to sleep. Um, and then Zomig uh, is also a nasal spray that um, similar to Maxalt um, that is available as a trip down. So here again are the triptans. I'll just highlight again that Maxalt is the one that's approved down to age six. Um, and then the others are approved from age 12 and up. They differ in their time of onset. So how long it takes to work and then how long they last. So their duration or half-life. And we will choose um, amongst them based on the history that's provided by the family. Sometimes insurance coverage will also play a role there. Um, the trip to, the side effects of triptans can often be problematic and people don't want to use them because of them, but they're really rare in children. Um, we know not to use triptans in people who have had prior um, blood vessel issues or have had stroke, um, but generally they're well tolerated. Um, some patients will have a sense of anxiety because they have tightness in their jaw or chest or feel dizzy um, or can get sleepy, but that's usually okay that you know going to sleep when you have a headache is often helpful. Um, the preventive therapies that we talk about in our clinic most often are the healthy habits, so lifestyle modification, um, behavioral education, so what are you doing when you get a headache, what is the what are the family members doing when the child has a headache. We talk about nutraceuticals, many families are interested in wondering in, you know, what supplements might be beneficial, and then preventive medications. We use less, probably less and less, but there are some available um, that have efficacy, shown efficacy in adults that we kind of extrapolate uh, into children, but there is no good evidence for the use of preventive medications in children. So here um, outlines the smart habits that we go over. So S is for sleep, M is for meals and hydration, um, A is for activity, R for relaxation, and T for triggers and treating early. So we try to um, enforce the smart, um, uh, the smart habits, usually easy to remember that way. Um, this is a website, the Headache Relief Guide, that can, can provide some additional information for families in terms of how to best treat episodes, how to prevent episodes, and how to work with your school um, if your child is ha experiencing headaches. Um, we really do try to be as proactive as possible with school. So we write letters saying that children should have 504 accommodations uh, if for to be allowed to go to the bathroom and drink water and have access, access to their medications and be allowed to treat their headaches and then go back to class um, rather than missing out on school or having their family their family have to come pick them up and miss out on work. If, um, if it's helpful, we will write out the plan for the teachers um, and we'll talk about our goal of school attendance, meaning we think children do best when they're attending school and if they're not currently attending school because things have gotten um, so out of hand, you know, having a gradual plan for returning. Um, and we really try to focus on functioning uh, instead of focusing on the pain or the disability, but you know, what are we able to get back to doing and how can we distract away from the pain and back towards function? Uh, we use a variety of scales to um, have families fill them out before they come in so that we can have a better understanding of headache disability, so how much headaches are impacting daily life for patients and their families. Um, and those are really helpful to us and when we have families fill them out ahead of time so that we can discuss them during our visits. Um, this is a great slide um, that highlights uh, a lot of what Dr. Kaplan does in our clinic. So talking with families about this, um, the scoring that they, the scales that they have filled out and kind of making observations about, you know, how a family is coping with both the episodes of headache and the other stressors that are going on in the family. Um, 
some families, when a headache happens, um, it can be a bigger deal than it needs to be. And this, we call that magnification or catastrophization. Like, oh no, this means the whole week is going to be a mess and I won't get do well on that test and I'll never go to college. Um, you know, so having those thoughts, which, which can affect our emotions, we can get more upset and feel helpless, which affects our behavior. So now I'm going to not even go to school because what if I were to get a headache and, you know, it would just be bad. And so this kind of um, cycle that can be perpetuated. Um, and so we're trying to address each of those aspects. So how can we decatastrophize? How can we uh, increase tolerance to stress? How can we, you know, develop pain coping behaviors and kind of work on things depending on what's going on with that patient and their family at each at each level in that cycle. Um, Again, I mentioned earlier that there really is no evidence for preventive medication use in children. There was a great study in 2017 called the CHAMP trial, which I encourage you to Google, type in CHAMP 2017. Um, and if that's not enough, type in New England Journal. And there's a great little two minute video that highlights the findings of that study, which I will try to summarize here. Essentially that when they looked at a large group of um, children and tried to figure out which preventive medicine was the most effective, um, they found that neither of the medicines studied, so amitriptyline or topiramate, neither of them were more effective than placebo, so a sugar pill. Um, and if anything, people that um, use placebo and cognitive behavioral therapy did the best. Um, so again, not, not supporting evidence for uh, medication use, but there are situations where we will use medications, uh, so, you know, mostly to try to exploit their side effects, believe it or not. Um, and I highlight here the 2021 update for the CHAMP trial, which showed that um, many of the people who were using preventive medicines uh, in 2017 were no longer using them in 2021, and many had prolonged benefit from cognitive behavioral therapy and from headache education. Um, this is again just uh, showing that same information in a bar graph. Um, the times we will talk about preventive therapy are when headaches are occurring more than twice a week and there's a high disability factor. Um, we really try to stress that medications are not the answer or they're not the cure, but sometimes medications can be helpful in breaking up a headache cycle. Also, when, when doing other things like lifestyle modification and getting into um, cognitive behavioral therapy to kind of retrain our brain. Medicines don't work right away, so setting clear expectations that it may take weeks or months to see a benefit. Um, and if we do use medicines, we use them for short term, maybe three to six months maximum. Um, again, just trying to kind of break up that cycle. Um, these are the medicines that we probably use most commonly, amitriptyline and topiramate in older kids. I would say ciproheptadine we use more commonly in kids 10 and under. Some of the vitamins that uh, we recommend to families are listed on the left. And then there are also neuromodulators. These are devices that are aimed at either the vagal nerve or the trigeminal nerve, so nerves that are in the forehead or the neck or the face. Um, and these are therapies that don't involve any medication, but have been shown to be effective in adults and in children. And these are things that we um, will provide uh, for patients to try out in clinic. There's one other one that I mentioned later called Norivio, but um, these are these are kind of nice for families who are not excited about using a medication or for people that haven't had benefit from medication. And they can use, be used both, <coughs> excuse me, to treat acute episodes and then also on a daily basis for prevention. Um, for patients who have tried various other preventive medications without benefit, some will proceed to trying Botox, which includes 31 injections into the forehead, scalp, and neck um, to try to relax the muscles um, that are involved in headache perpetuation. And those uh, injection sites are shown here. Um, so this is not for beauty, but rather for relaxing the muscles of the head and neck, which can help with headache as well. This is approved in children. Um, and then um, CGRP modulators, you might have heard about those in the news more so in the past couple of year, years. This is a category of medications that are um, injected or infused and are given either weekly or monthly um, for headache prevention. And they're a really exciting area of prevention, of prevention um, approved more so in the older group, so in adults, but certainly we're getting more and more um, access to these in younger people. So an exciting area for headache. Um, again, I mentioned that Nerivio and the Rilivion, so those are um, various neuromodulators that are used for treatment. Um, some patients also benefit from nerve blocks, so lidocaine injections either into their neck or into the um, into the top of the or through the nose um, for acute treatment of migraine. 
Um, we don't do a lot of those in our clinic. We focus, we, again, because we probably end up seeing many more chronic migraine patients, but um, that is something that uh, people can have access to. And then I list here some of the other newer acute treatment options um, available in adults that are not yet available for adolescents, but just if you've heard about them. These are some website resources for headache that I think are really helpful for um, patients and families to learn more about headaches if they're interested in doing so. Um, the American Migraine Foundation specifically has a lot of great videos and they have a whole pediatric section um, that is a great resource. And these are some of the references. So if anyone wants to ask questions, I might be happy to chat more.